Uh, thank all of you for, for taking the time to come again, and thank all of those uh, watching online uh, through streaming or otherwise at another time on replay. It's certainly a, a tremendous event, and I can't thank uh, Stephen Shore enough and his team behind the scenes of, of orchestrating all this. It's, uh, this is a, an event of enlightenment, and uh, we need to take this to another level and do it quickly. Welcome to part two of this presentation about food choice and sustainability, that critical connection. And if you weren't able to make it to part one uh, session yesterday, that we split this out for you, uh, this is what you missed. And uh, you're never going to hear it again, anywhere, ever. You're done. <laughs> so, not really. Uh, you actually will be able to uh, access a recording of, of my presentations, both part one and part two, and all the presentations of this wonderful event through their website. So I encourage everyone to, to do that, and as Stephen said, spread it as, as quickly as possible. This is what we're going to cover today. It doesn't seem like much, but I could spend a year or more talking about each one of these uh, critical topics that affects all of us. There's a very real and imminent threat to our existence that's not found in the headlines of the news because no one wants to talk about it. No one's willing to step forward and manage it. Our species is in a state of unsustainability. That, that's a fact. But that in itself is not the entire problem. The real problem is that why we as a civilization are not pulling out of it. So today, I'm going to be discussing more about this critical food choice, sustainability, environment disconnect. How serious our predicament is, why we're not evolving toward a sustainable future, and how to remedy the situation in the quickest way possible. It seems that in many areas of the world, uh, where I travel, they, they, they pride themselves on being ecologically astute, doing what they think is right for the environment. Uh, wherever I travel, I can't help but notice the tone of buying local, uh, conserving water and energy, lessening our dependence on fossil fuels, recycling, protecting our soil by perhaps taking down evil GMOs, all certainly important. But today I'm here to shed a new, more clarifying light as I did yesterday on this environment issue, and submit to you the real problem, which is not Monsanto. The real problem is with us, our lack of awareness. And then after we become aware, which many of us are, the problem is with our decisions, our thought process. Are we being selfish? Or perhaps could we be selfless? Knowing and doing. Let's begin by reminding ourselves that we're in overshoot mode, demanding more of our planet than what it can supply. We reviewed this yesterday. Today in the United States, it would require five full Earths to sustain what we're currently taking from and doing to our planet. In fact, five out of nine identified tipping points or planetary boundaries related to our life support systems on Earth, five out of nine have already been passed. And all nine, our boundaries are interconnected. As one collapses, the others will soon follow. So we clearly need to quickly change our ecological footprint. But how do we do this? We can blame overpopulation, but are we really going to begin culling other humans? We tried to do that yesterday, <laughs> and it didn't work. We can reduce our dependence on fossil fuels, but that'll take too long, and climate change is only one of the many tipping points that confront us. The single largest component of our collective ecological footprint can be found on our plates with the animal products that we eat. Therefore, the qu easiest, quickest, and most comprehensive way to reduce our ecological footprint and set a course toward true sustainability for our species and all other species that we share this planet with is by way of food choice. It requires only one change, and it can be accomplished today. It's true, we now know that the single sector most responsible for nearly all aspects of our unsustainability combined, or what I call global depletion, is that of animal agriculture, the meat, dairy, and fishing industries. They just don't want you to know this, of course. And as we move away from processed foods, and move away from high fructose corn syrup, and move away from factory farms, we must remember that this environmental issue is not a sugar issue, and it's not a factory farm issue at all. We need to uh, me most concerned about. It's a, it's a raising animals to eat issue. And we're going to see that as we go along again today as we did yesterday. So let's, let's look at a couple uh, of the many timelines that we're faced with. We've already talked about many of these tipping points yesterday, including lack of fresh water, loss of topsoil, climate change, loss of biodiversity, rapid rate of extinctions, tropical rainforest destruction. Did we really cover all those things yesterday? <laughs> That's pretty good. 
Uh, at the beginning of this sustainability equation is the word itself, sustainable, which is now seen everywhere. But, but this word is typically misused, and it's ill-defined because rarely, if ever, I found that food choice properly connected to sustainability efforts, especially the raising and eating of animals, despite the enormous effect. It's simply, apparently, too challenging for everyone, culturally, socially. But this is the reason we're in a sustainability crisis today. As a global community, we've been too slow in realizing the unsustainability state that we're in. We've been vastly too slow in making the connection to animal agriculture. And we've been indifferent to act. We talked about climate change quite a bit yesterday, so let's summarize by remembering that it's, it's, it's very real, it's urgent, and our approach to management has to be swift and it has to happen now. We're on a very real timeline, perhaps two years. We also must remember that climate change will have the effects of exacerbation. It takes events and makes matters worse. Global warming and climate change, for instance, will not be the initial cause of these categories of global depletion. We cause these things. Climate change will worsen them. The words food, meat, consumption, slaughter, and protein really shouldn't be words that we associate with animals. I mean, after all, we're animals. <laughs> we talk about this protein and, of course, slaughtering. We talk about these issues frequently at our, at our sanctuary in Michigan. Uh, here, my faithful research assistants are looking over my notes and reminding me to put a good word in about turkeys, which I... <laughs> headed by the lead assistant, Turkey there. And we often talk about words and definitions on our daily walks. And I'm not sure which of these two little buddies want to be called protein. <laughs> I mean, Barney's having here a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with us about this terminology problem. Uh, he doesn't like to be called protein. He doesn't like to be called pork. And he doesn't like to be called bacon either. It's just Barney. And here are a few others who'd like to voice their opinion while they have a chance. Uh, after they finish eating their protein, which is grass. It's fine enough for all of them. And talking about words and definitions, Plato still wants to put in a word. He, he wonders why we humans choose to call him protein instead of, say, for instance, calling him fat. Or maybe we could call him carbo. <laughs> I mean, he's confused. But nevertheless, he wants to be called simply Plato. Very special. And what about this phrase? How often do you hear this phrase? Millions and millions of people proclaim their love of fish every day of the year, and yet we eat them. In fact, for 98% of all individuals in the world, this phrase, I love fish, actually means I love to eat fish, doesn't it? Yeah, of course it does, because if you loved fish, as in loving your cat or your dog, you certainly wouldn't kill and eat them, would you? No, I, I don't think so. Again, it's, it's how we use our words, isn't it? The three principal ways our oceans are being destroyed, and all three are caused or at least heavily affected by food choice. Raising and eating animals on land causes warming and acidification of our oceans, which is now irreversible in our lifetime. It's one of the boundaries that we've passed. Surface runoff from livestock operations on land has caused more than 550 nitrogen-flooded dead zones around the world, comprising 95,000 square miles of areas completely devoid of oxygen or life. So any meaningful discussion of the state of our oceans has to first begin with frank discussions about land-based animal agriculture, but it is fishing that has the largest impact of all. Incredibly large amounts of sea life are taken from our oceans in three ways. First, they're taken as target fish. You know, that, that's the one you want to eat. Fish are also taken out of our oceans to feed other fish grown on factory fish farms, part of the aquaculture movement. And lastly, fish are taken as bykill due to the first two types of fishing. Many call it bycatch, it's actually bykill. Well, that, that really doesn't leave too much in our oceans now, does it? In fact, our oceans are being ravaged, and yet everyone we know still eats fish. Fragile, interdependent, and poorly understood ecosystems have been devastated. Over 90 million tons of fish were caught last year, and quite a few more millions and millions of tons of bykill which are all those other innocent sea life caught, killed, and discarded in the process of trying to catch that targeted fish everyone's asking for. Bykill includes juvenile fish, they'll never make their way to maturity, all seven of the endangered sea turtles, sea lions, birds, dolphins. It's so sad. Even, even whales are bykill. 
Of the 17 major fishing stock areas in the world, all of them are either overexploited or on the verge of collapse. 87% of the world's fish species are affected, considered heavily depleted from overfishing practices. Well, that's quite a bit of damage. But along comes this word sustainable to justify continued extractions or harvesting. How is this word even used in the fishing industry? Who defines it? Who monitors it? And with less than 1%, of all of our oceans being regulated, le less than 1% of all of our oceans are being regulated, then who decides on enforcement? If you look at this carefully, or even not so carefully, <laughs> the, the real answer is no one. And I say real answer because now there's sea life caught and labeled sustainable, as we all know, when in fact it's not. But it's still labeled as such by a number of highly respected organizations, such as the Marine Stewardship Council, or MSC. The, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch highly respected organization, still has lobster from the Gulf of Maine listed as a good alternative. It's not a good alternative for many reasons. Rapidly declining number of lobster, inefficient trapping mechanisms, and most importantly is the sad effect lobster trapping has on a critically endangered North Atlantic right whale. There are only 400 of these magnificent creatures left that we haven't killed. And nearly all of them, 82% of them, are getting entangled, injured, and killed in those trap lines. But it's not just lobster trap lines from Maine that cause all the problems behind the scenes. It's, it's fishing nets from all over the world. Whales caught in fishing nets die a very slow, painful, agonizing death while trying to desperately free themselves over a period of six months' time on average from the time they first became entangled. Six months. We owe these whales and lobsters much more than this or this. Elsewhere in the world, there have been an estimated 705,000 tons, or roughly 500 miles, of non-biodegradable fishing nets cut loose from fishing vessels each year for the past 25 years, catching countless numbers of unsuspecting sea life. When researchers in ocean conservation groups discuss the topic of overfishing, they typically point to the tons of wild fish caught per year, and those raised from aquaculture, and they call this production. Well, I look at this much differently and certainly more accurately by adding to these figures another 28 million tons of IUU, which is illegally caught, unregulated, and unreported, which I don't even know how they can come up with a number for that. And also you have to add to this figure bykill, which amounts to perhaps another 200 million tons of sea animals per year. So it's not accurate for researchers to call any of this production, because in reality what we're doing is destroying. Fishing, of course, destroys species of target fish, as we just said, but it also destroys ecosystems and biodiversity. All forms of fishing are destructive by definition, because it kills something. Fishing also destroys habitat with trawling, middle and deep and high trawling that excavates and ruins ocean floors, purse seine methods that drop a mile-long net, circles around it, draws it tight, and catches every form of sea life in the middle. This is mostly how tuna is caught. Then there's longline fishing, where a, drop, where a boat drops a main fishing line that can be up to 60 miles long with thousands and thousands of hooks and barbs and catching whatever sea life happens to get in its way. The only fishing methods fully banned, are using explosives and poisons. But that's some, somewhat of a joke because those methods are on the rise because they're unenforceable. Again, only 1% of the oceans are even regulated. You know, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch is aptly named because that's exactly what they're doing. They're watching all this happen while promoting it to be continued. And irrespective of climate change, it doesn't, climate change doesn't, doesn't matter here. It's predicted that we will lose nearly all commercially recognized sea life on our oceans by collapse of their systems by the year 2048. So how effective is that sustainable seafood label? There are many, many examples of oceanic species that have collapsed while under the watch of our two certified sustainable organizations since they were formed in the mid to late 1990s. Everything on this list is uh, considered and labeled sustainable, but, but none of them really are. Cod were fished only 1% of their original numbers off the coast of Newfoundland, more recently to near, a near extinct status in the North Sea, while stated that they were sustainable. They'll never recover in our lifetime. 
Now, I've run out of room on this one slide to show you all the species in trouble, so, so here's a number for you. Over 1,000 types of fish are affected. And so it is with fishing under that sustainable label. Target fish are becoming extinct. We move on to the next fish in line, creating cereal depletion, and then other sea life up and down the food web are becoming extinct. A cascade effect, all part of the collateral damage that begins with us. Coral reef systems are around the world are in serious trouble. Most of us know that. The Great Barrier Reef has lost more than half of its coral cover since 1985. Most would think it's due to pollution and climate change. That's what we'd like to blame it on. But the primary cause of coral reef death there throughout the Caribbean and throughout most of the world is not pollution. And it's not from climate change. It's from overfishing. An example in the other direction can be found in the Queens Islands off the southern coast of Cuba where they haven't allowed any commercial fishing and the coral reef ecosystems there look the same as they have for the past several thousands of years. One of the most important factors in balancing coral reef ecosystems are predatory fish like sharks, but we're killing them too, quite a few of them. One third of all shark species are nearing extinction. We're killing around 100 million sharks per year. Why? Well, 40 to 70 million sharks have their fins cut off like this, and then they're thrown overboard to die so we can eat shark fin soup. And it's terrible to see this, isn't it? And I know what you're thinking, you're saying to yourselves, I don't eat shark fin soup. No, nope, not me. And furthermore, it's banned in 11 states in our country. And isn't that great? But again, over 98% of us do eat fish. And by eating fish, any type of fish, we're doing this to 60 million sharks that are caught each year and killed in fishing nets and fishing lines as bykill. 60 million. So, so go ahead and ban shark fin soup all you want. But why would you stop there? If you're truly concerned about endangered sea turtles, whales, dolphins, sharks, and the state of our oceans. If you're truly concerned, you should ban fishing. Well, many fisheries that are accepted and labeled as sustainable are actually viewed by scientists as unsustainable. And I could show you hundreds of examples of statements by scientists that realize that it's unsustainable. Killing krill now has become a very big business. But you don't need to eat krill or any other sea life or animal to get your omega-3s. Unless, of course, you listen to Dr. Oz. <laughs> He'll tell you something different. Krill is, though, fundamental to the survival of almost every animal species in and around the Antarctic, once the most abundant animal species on Earth. Krill numbers have dropped by 78% since 1980, in turn affecting the decline of a number of penguin species and making it difficult for baleen whales, such as blue, right, and fin, who are trying desperately to make a comeback. The quota or maximum sustainable yield for extracting krill out of our oceans and killing them has been placed at 1.5 million tons per year. And yet scientists admit to knowing very little about krill or their interconnected ecosystems heavily affected by krill, such as phytoplankton and algae in one direction that krill feed off of, or all the other species that feed on krill in the other direction. Two new reports were released recently indicating that the amount of sea life extracted from our oceans over the years were vastly underestimated by the United Nations and that reef fishing by, by local indigenous people that we thought were just fine are actually doing more damage than they once thought with various species being exploited at much higher rates than previous, previously predicted, all simply adding to the gloomy picture of our lack of stewardship in our oceans. In the Pacific Northwest, similar to other seacoast areas of the world, there's a blind spot when it comes to fishing. It's a very uneasy topic to confront. Our government declared the Snake River sockeye salmon here, beautiful, beautiful fish, endangered. They declared endangered in 1991, but within just eight years, their numbers plummeted. And, and 16 other salmon species were in trouble shortly thereafter. Earlier this year, the Puget Sound was closed to commercial fishing, which is the right thing to do, long term. The, the numbers of most species of salmon, cod, tuna, swordfish, halibut, and many other large species have declined by over 90% of their original numbers. Bluefin tuna and swordfish species are less than 4% of their historic numbers, still not protected by the Endangered Species Act because, well, we would rather eat them into extinction. Instead of eating dolphin-free tuna, 
we should be concerned about eating simply tuna-free. This is a Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch's approved sustainable method of catching tuna. A good recent example of our certified sustainable systems not working is with sardines. These fish are in serious trouble, and you might ask, who cares about sardines? Well, the answer is we should all care about sardines, and we should all care about all species of animals that we share this planet with. Their population has dropped by 93% just in the last eight years. 93% are gone. Once the most abundant fish in the California current, spanning from Alaska to, to Mexico, many scientists predict that sardines are not going to recover in the next 30 or 40 years, if at all. Losses have been blamed on the warm blob, uh, an area in the ocean uh, that's a little warmer than others. But all scientists agree that overfishing is the principal problem. And even if there's some correlation to their losses and to, to global warming and the, and the plummeting numbers of sardines or any species, then that's just one more reason to stop fishing them, isn't it? And to allow them to recover. And even though there's a current ban on sardine fishing, sardines can still be caught as bikel. That's <laughs> how ridiculous our system is. Uh, and bikel can be up to 50% of the total catch of any particular fishing boat. Down the Pacific coast a little ways, we have the other half to the story about sardines. Last year, more than 3,000 starving sea lion pups were found stranded. Studies revealed that this was because the mother sea lions were undernourished because their favorite food is sardines. This, of course, is only the tip of the ecological iceberg as numerous other species that rely on sardines are likely in trouble. Whales, dolphins, tuna, pelicans, nearly all predator fish. We just can't see them struggling as easily as we can see these pups. So how are we managing these issues? Well, scientists knew about the collapse of these fish in 2012, and they knew about the devastating effect on other species such as sea lions that are still not addressed today, with, with fishing executives blaming the crash, uh, crash of sardines on climate change, and they blamed it on El Nino. This is very similar to what's occurring with dwindling populations of anchovy off the coast of Peru, the loss of Manhattan in the Chesapeake Bay. 98% of all pelagic fish that are caught, 98% are fed to livestock, farmed fish in aquaculture settings, and they're fed to pigs in China. The most heavily killed fish species in the world is the Alaskan pollock, harvested at a rate of 3 million tons per year, and yet it's still labeled as sustainable. Who, who would think you could take three million tons of any species from anywhere on Earth and think they wouldn't be missed somehow? Only us. Here's, here's the point regarding our oceans. We could talk for, our, for hours about this, but it's no longer a problem of overfishing. Now, that was a term that could be applied accurately back in the early to mid-1800s. Today, it's about fishing. Well, not to worry, because now we have fish farms. Over 50% of all fish consumed worldwide are produced from aquaculture, which is growing faster than any other food sector. One reason for this tremendous growth is a very false illusion of environmentalism. Asia now produces 91% of all farm fish in the world. Shrimp, tilapia, carp. Well, here we have another interesting idea where fish are caught in our already ravaged oceans to feed other fish, produced on factory fish farms, sometimes at a ratio of 20 to 1, in the form of fish, fish meal, fish oil, 88% of all fish oil produced in the world now is given to, to fish on these fish farms. Well, very soon we're going to be running out of fish in our oceans. And very soon we're going to be running out of, out of land to raise livestock. So we're going to be turning to this, a more closed-loop system of aquaculture called aquaponics, a combination of aquaculture and hydroponics that grows both fish and plants. Businesses are already snatching up abandoned industrial warehouses in many urban settings. This happens to be one in Chicago. Raising fish in tanks, growing vegetables with the wastewater on top, and then cycling it back to the fish. But all of these systems, every one of them, uses massive amounts of electricity, and all of them use massive amounts of feed inputs. 60% of all fish farms are land-based. Some are indoors, and some are outside, like this one that I visited. Uh, he, he's proudly showing me the protein that they produce there. Funny. Looks like a fish that they produce to me. And, and regardless of where the fish on your plate comes from, now or in the future, is the process of catching and slaughtering fish. Is that process humane? 
Well, that's a good question, isn't it? Because if it isn't humane, then why do we do it? Do any of you know what nociceptors are? Especially polymodal nociceptors. They're sensory receptors associated with feeling pain. All of you have them. Most mammals have numerous polymodal nociceptors in and around their face, their head, their neck. So do fish. They can, they can feel this. In reality, there's no such thing as sustainable commercial fishing today, especially if you apply the three factors of how that word sustainable is defined by the industry itself. This is right from the industry. In order for a species or a specific marine species and fishery location to be certified sustainable, all three of these objectives must be met. There must be no negative effect on target fish itself. Well, we saw that that's impossible. There's no negative effect on any other species. Well, that doesn't take place. And there must be a means of verifiable monitoring. But again, less than 1% of all of our oceans are even protected or monitored. In reality, none of these factors exist for any fish labeled as sustainable. It's simply driven by our lack of respect for life in our oceans and driven by, of course, economics. Oh, and please note the sobering statistic at the bottom of this slide. Over 200 million sea animals are extracted from our oceans every hour. So why can't we give our oceans a break? Seems like the logical thing to do. That's what I would do if I was in charge of the oceans. <laughs> What's inhibiting us from providing complete rest for our oceans, which is what they need? And it's been shown to work historically in various settings around the world. Well, is it because of economics? Sure. Sure it is. That's the argument. Global subsidies for the fishing industry are now at $35 billion per year, which then supports continued devastation of our oceans. Global revenues from fishing are at $90 billion per year, but only $16 billion of that is from deep sea fishing. So again, $16 billion are revenues from deep sea fishing, while fish sequester greenhouse gases. Not counting all the sea life found in our reef systems, which is considerable, recent studies found that deep sea fish sequester up to two gigatons of greenhouse gas emissions per year. That equates to $222 billion per year savings in costs in our efforts to battle global warming just because of deep sea fish sequestration of carbon dioxide and methane. So there's a clear argument, isn't there, for banning fish on the high seas strictly from an economic standpoint. It's in the other direction. Fish are more valuable if left alone in our oceans as live climate change mitigating agents than as food on our plates. $222 billion versus $16 billion. That's my math. With continued extraction, warming, acidification, and deoxygenation, our oceans that we once felt were so robust will very soon be unable to support what few life forms remain in and around them. So then these are the timelines and tipping points for our oceans, and they look like this. This is not science fiction. It's not something I made up on the trip down to Orlando. It's reality. And quite sadly, this has all happened on our watch. You're looking at what we've created, or our parents have helped us create, and are passing on now to future generations. Our oceans provide half of the planet's oxygen, absorb half of man-made greenhouse gas emissions, and is the nucleus for our complex food chain. So it's very true that when our oceans die, we die. So how do we solve all this? All these issues of global depletion, knowing and doing. Over the years, I've been proposing two categories of solutions over the past 42 years. First, there needs to be widespread, sweeping education of the public and those with a platform of influence. We essentially need to educate the educated, and we need to reach a higher level of consciousness. It's not about just being aware. And second, we need to implement initiatives based on that education, such as creating policies which open the doors for businesses and help new and also young farmers and help transition existing farms from animal agriculture to plant-based systems, beginning with the reallocation of the $500 billion per year we spend globally subsidizing the meat, dairy, and fishing industries to prop it up. This money could be spent much more wisely and effectively for education and then transitioning purposes. So I have another solution, dealing with accountability, which would get us on track much quicker 
if someone would listen to this. <laughs> and it's what I call the eco and health risk tax. This is something we've never done before because the true cost to our environment and to our own health has always been externalized, hasn't it? It's, it's, it's never been directly paid for with our heads always turned in the opposite direction. Well, you're all familiar with the nutrition fact label, I hope. You should be looking at what you're eating. This happens to be ground beef or ground cow, something that the average consumer would purchase. And on this label, you can see that half the calories are from fat. And most of those are from saturated fat, even a gram of trans fat, and quite a bit of cholesterol. Now, all that's not so good. But you don't see not so good on the label anywhere, do you? <laughs> I don't see it. And it also has quite a bit of protein, but it's, it's of the type of protein that's associated with a number of Western diseases after you eat it. And you certainly don't, don't see what resources it took to produce, what's inside that package. Well, consumers need to know what effect this product had on our environment while producing it and what effect it'll have on our health after consuming it. So we introduce the eco and health risk, risk factors first. In the event these, these numbers are a little too complicated, going from, from minus 100 to 100, if that's a little too complicated, we put a little, no, little notation on the, on the label. Uh, it's something like this. You could say not so good, or, or, or it could say uh, not a good choice. Or in, the, or in the future, when all this becomes voice activated, a little Siri voice could pop out and slap your hand and say, I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't do that if I were you. <laughs> uh, this is a good start. But it's most important to reflect these factors into costs. And someday with the correct economic formulation and a more gutsy and a, and a proper policy change, we may even see this in our meat aisle, a quarter pound beef patty priced at over $4,000. And it'd be a steal at these prices if you had to go back and replace the resources, some of them ancient, in order to produce it. So we need to impose this tax on producers and consumers who generate the most inefficient, resource-depleting food items. This, this scenario of accountability will, of course, be inevitable as we begin to run more and more out of vital resources. Well, this is not a carbon tax. It's not a, it's not a soda tax, which would vastly understate the problem. But if we can do this for, for soft drinks in, at Berkeley, <laughs> we should certainly be able to apply this concept to meat and dairy products that affect us on a much, much larger scale. It's a simple concept. Make everyone pay for the resources they're wasting and for the health costs incurred by society. While truly impossible to come up with a replacement cost for natural resources that we destroy, estimates by environmental economists place the value of our natural resources that we use up to $63 trillion worth of goods and services per year. But our current economic and political systems in place treat these resources and services as if they had zero value, with no one paying for their use. That isn't right, of course, and it's catching up to us. This, along with aquaculture, is one of the questions of our future, isn't it? It's a topic that's gaining momentum. And I find it's a, a natural path for most people wanting so badly to hang on to the false sense of needing versus simply wanting to eat animal products. It's a path of least resistance, let's face it. So let's look at a couple different ways to answer this question. And there you have it. That's, that's one way to answer it. I mean, he thinks so, and so do many others. My thought, though, is that we need to be fully aware of the consequences of our food choices, not partially aware. And we need to understand what we're doing to all aspects of global depletion. We need to know the urgency of the problem and the timelines we're on. This is not a go meatless on Monday type of problem or when we get around to it type of problem. So I have another way to answer this grass-fed question. If I gave each one of you one acre of land to grow your own food, any food you want, what would you grow? What, what should you grow? Well, at all my other college and university lectures, the students know what they want to grow. <laughs> I, I don't know what this is yet, but that's what they tell me they want to grow. <laughs> And there's a way they could grow that and make, make it work. <laughs> On this one acre, you could try to raise one grass-fed cow, thinking it's fully sustainable, just like that New York Times multiple-time best-selling author is telling everyone. But in most areas of the world, one acre is not enough. You're going to need 5, 10, 15. I've seen areas that need 50 acres for one cow. So you could use your one acre for grass-fed livestock, and you'd end up with about 50 to 100 pounds of a type of food that's then implicated in numerous disease states after you eat it. And along the way, you've produced six to seven tons of methane and carbon dioxide, and you've used one to two million gallons of water for that cow and feed for the cow, 
while continuing the loss of biodiversity. Or instead, if you used your acre of land to grow a vegetable, fruit, grain combination, you've produced 20 to 60,000 pounds of food that's infinitely healthier for you to eat and for our planet to grow. And when looking at global growing applications, I mean, how cool is this? Certain plants like kale will, will actually continue to grow through extremes of temperatures, from minus 5 degrees here in my, in my backyard <laughs> over the winter through 100 degrees Fahrenheit. And after you pick the leaves to eat of something like kale, after you pick the leaves, does anybody know what happens? New ones grow back. <laughs> yeah, they regenerate. I bet your cow can't do that. <laughs> It's astounding what you can produce on that one acre over the period of time it would take to raise your one grass-fed cow. It's quite an amazing difference, isn't it? Now imagine extrapolating that model out in terms of global use of our resources and now answer that question about how sustainable raising grass-fed livestock really is. That's what I'm asking here before I was hastily escorted off the farm. <laughs> no, I, I wasn't. And for those who still think that eating any animal is sustainable, it's time to introduce and understand and appreciate this concept. Optimal or optimal relative sustainability. That'll work. How sustainable is it to raise and eat any animal product in a relative sense as compared to plant-based foods? How can we best use our dwindling natural resources? What foods will have the very least effect on climate change? Which foods best promote our own human health and which are the most compassionate? All wrapped up into one package. Well, how nice is that? This is the way we need to start viewing things in a relative sense as to then how to achieve optimal sustainability. Well, how many of you have visited Hawaii? Great. Great. It's a beautiful state, isn't it? Earlier this year, I was asked to speak at their Capitol building. Uh, it was quite an honor, and I was quite humbled to receive a, an honorary award from the Hawaii Senate talking about their environment. And yes, it's a beautiful state, but from a sustainability standpoint, it's a mess. Hawaii can't grow enough food for its own human population of one million people, so it imports over 90% of its food at a tune of $3 billion per year. That's what Hawaii's doing. But, looking at this more closely, 83% of their agricultural land in Hawaii isn't used to grow food. 83% of their agricultural land isn't growing food. It's used for grazing cattle, which then produces less than 40 pounds of meat, something they call food, less than 40 pounds of meat per acre used. Their second largest use of land is for producing Roundup Ready GMO seeds by Monsanto and DuPont, who have taken over four of Hawaii's islands now. 98% of those seeds that are produced in Hawaii are used for feed crops for livestock back here on the mainland. So the amount of land in Hawaii that's used for animal agriculture is nearly 800,000 acres. That's 50 times more land than what's being used to grow plants for direct human consumption in their state. Hawaii's once pristine reef systems are now in serious decline. Hawaii once had the largest number of indigenous fish species in the world, found nowhere else on Earth. 75% of these fish species of Hawaii are in critical condition, with many species near the larger islands dropping in numbers by as much as 90%. The reason for this decline is not a mystery to me. It's overfishing, commercial as well as recreational. Hawaii has essentially run out of land, and they've run out of fish. It's a perfect example. Hawaii is a perfect example of where we are headed as a planet. They are just a few years ahead of us, and for now, Hawaii has the ability to import food from somewhere else, whereas we, as a global civilization, do not. The recommendations I gave to their senators are these. It's quite simple. Hawaii needs to provide complete rest for their oceans and reefs, and they need to convert all land used for animal agriculture to organic plant-based systems that will use their land much more efficiently, and to do this immediately before I got on the plane and left. Regarding the, the global picture, uh, a large part of our solution process will be these agricultural systems and movements that you see here. Community-supported agriculture, farm-to-table, small and local farms, real food, slow food, organic, biodynamic, traceable, urban agriculture, they all, they all make sense. Only if they do not involve animals, then they do not make sense. Globally, 4 billion people live in cities. Over 80% in the United States are considered urban dwellers right now, and cities across the globe are where most of the increase in population will occur over the next 25 years, with nearly 70% of the 9.6 billion people in the world living in cities by the year 2050. 
So urban agriculture is going to be very important. They're already growing food on porches, windowsills, and rooftops in many cities around the world, growing food as efficiently as possible. It's great to see this. You can't grow a cow up there on that roof. In the future, we'll be hearing more and more about these topics, all part of the better meat movement. And that's why we're going to review a little of this today. It's, it's going to be very important as, as time moves on. These are all part of the better meat movement, which simply impedes our evolution toward plant-based systems. What exactly does that mean, better meat? Basically, for those who argue this point, and there are many scientists who argue this point with me, better meat means that you can eat all the meat you want, but it should be humane, have more human health benefits, and better for our environment than regular meat. But there's one significant problem with this argument. There is no meat that is more humane, more, has more health, human health benefits, and is better for our environment than whole plant-based foods. So in reality, there, there isn't any argument. But as it goes, we're going to be seeing this, so let's review it for a moment. I found that this concept of better meat falls into two categories who argue it. The first category of better meat is grass-fed, pastured, humane-raised beef, chicken, pork, turkey, whatever animal you want to put in there, fish and aquaculture settings. And the second category is meat created in a laboratory. Mm -hmm. You're going to be seeing this. And looking at the first category, all grass-fed, pastured animals are in many ways more unsustainable than factory farmed animals. So that's not better, is it? Grass-fed meat is still unhealthy for human consumption as compared to plant-based foods. And grass-fed meat is produced from animals that are still slaughtered. And by any stretch of the imagination, that's not humane. So the only people who think this is better meat in terms of the grass-fed movement are those who are blinded by producing it or eating it and they just don't want to see the truth. Now, regarding the second category, which is meat produced in the laboratory, once at $330,000 per single patty in just three years ago in 2013, now it's about $5,000 per burger patty. I had the opportunity to speak one-on-one -on -one with the CEOs of the two leading companies in this, in this laboratory meat market, and there are a couple things that are very clear. Although meat produced in the lab has some, but not all the humane aspects worked out. For instance, they still use fetal bovine serum for their medium, for their solutions. And they have some of the environmental aspects that will be improved. But both companies who are leading this movement stated that they're about 10 years away from public launch. And from an environmental standpoint, as we saw even yesterday, we don't have 10 years. And from a human health standpoint, well, laboratory meat is sketchy at best. For example, both companies couldn't answer my questions about human health because their laboratory meat, as of now, will still have all the components that degrade our own human health as regular meat, such as cholesterol, saturated fat, lack of fiber, lack of phytonutrients, lack of antioxidants, lack of anti-inflammatory agents, no anti-cancer, anti-angiogenic substances, and laboratory meat will still have all the inflammatory stressors that come along with the meat that we're eating now, such as creating increased acidity, which you do not want, increased levels of C-reactive protein, arachidonic acid. All meat has, laboratory or not, will have higher levels of methionine, sulfur, acid, promoting amino acids, which promote Alzheimer's disease as well as others, dementia. They all have endotoxins. Laboratory meat will also still have all the cancer-causing agents when cooked, such as heterocyclic amines, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, etc. So no, there's nothing better about better meat produced in the laboratory, especially when compared to plant-based foods that take you in the opposite direction by preventing all these diseases. Again, there is no argument. Well, then, of course, we have to deal with this. More than 5 million people have seen this original TED Talk, and many organizations are now using it as justification for furthering the livestock industry at the detriment of our planet. This is going on behind the scenes. If you don't know who this is, it's Alan Savory. And since we don't have another two or three hours to expound on this topic, I can offer you these sources to bolster your understanding about this argument. I've covered this quite well in my second book, Food Choice and Sustainability. This Savory TED Talk, then, is one idea that's, that's not, worth, not worth spreading. Alan Savory's methods have been proven not to work, but it's what 99% of the global population want to hear. How can we still keep eating meat? And the line of argument is becoming the latest buzz. 
He calls it holistic management, but essentially it's another term for grass-fed or pastured livestock systems, just like all the others that you see on this list. And you'll be seeing this being translated into products in the grocery store and on the news. All of this equates to continued loss of natural resources, suboptimal human health, and unnecessary slaughtering when any animal is entered into the equation. The report by Paul Hawkins, a uh, revered scientist, author at Berkeley, this, this report is called Drawdown, and it's going to be released later this year. You're going to hear, you're going to hear about this on 60 Minutes in the Today Show pretty soon. It's, it's very limited in scope, and it repeats all the, what the rest of these methods are saying, that we need to eat animals and that hooved animals, such as domesticated cows, are necessary for human survival because there's no other way for healthy soil and production of food and us to coexist. Well, this is one of the many panels that I've been involved with in the last year or two regarding this specific topic. And I, I was involved in this at the Scripps Research Institute in San Diego, whereby all the participants that you see here, except for this guy right here on the far left, <laughs> every participant there were arguing that ruminants, such as cows and their hooves, are necessary for grasslands to exist. And the earth is covered by 30% grasslands. And it's the only way to remedy desertified areas, areas that have no, they're basically deserts that have lost all their topsoil, and that we will all perish if these systems aren't in place, basically stating that factory farms are harmful, which, which they are, and that we need to continue eating meat of all types, but especially from cows by turning all of our farmland and damaged soils into grazing pastures. That'll save us. Well, it's too bad that these scientists and livestock advocates are overlooking the fact that there are many examples in the world, many, many examples in the world that have been ravaged by livestock over the years, areas that have been deforested and topsoil lost because of grazing livestock. And now, many of these areas are flourishing with wildlife and plants without the influence of any, any cattle or any hooved animals. The theory that livestock are necessary or rebu for rebuilding soil or for our existence is completely erroneous. One perfect example of this is with this guy. In 1980, Ernst Gutsch moved from Germany to an area of destroyed rainforest of a little over 1,000 acres in Brazil. It was called the dry wasteland by local tribes. The, the land was ruined because it was originally ancient tropical rainforest, maybe up to 50 million years old, all cut down because pigs and cattle were raised on it and crops to feed them. This is very typical of most of the areas in, in the Amazon that we talked about yesterday. Then erosion occurred, and then all the topsoil was lost, and nothing could grow on it. It was basically a desert. It was dry wasteland. Well, Ernst be began his form of agroforestry here by planting seeds of indigenous crops, such as bananas, cocoa, and within 30 years, the rainforest had been rebuilt. It came back. It looks like this now. Notice that you don't see any hooved animals. You don't see livestock. 17 streams and rivers returned. The climate cooled with cycling, recycling of rainwater. Species of animals and plants returned, and again, this was this was without hooved animals. Proving that this reforestation and rebuilding, to go just one last step further, proving that this rebuilding of topsoil can be done in other climates other than tropical rainforests, here's another perfect example of an area that had been more than 90% of its topsoil lost. I'm going to circle an area for you to take a look at above the tree line where nothing could grow. And most of the plants and animals were either exterminated or displaced. A decision was made to simply put this land to rest. No livestock at all. It wasn't touched. Just allowed to heal on its own, and a remarkable evolution began immediately when livestock and conventional row crop farming were removed from the picture. This is the way it looks today. So notice this amazing transformation, and especially the area that I circle here, which is the same area where nothing could grow. And this amazing transformation continued over the next 36 years on this, on this wonderful farm. Natural pasture and woodlands returned, species of insects, birds, and other animals reappeared. Pollinators became plentiful when they once were non-existent. Non -existent. This is the way it looks today. It's an amazing story of regeneration without the need for livestock. And by the way, I had the opportunity to verify all this as being accurate and follow the story along quite carefully every day since 1979 because you know what? This is our property. It's our rescue and sanctuary back in Michigan. This is where my lovely wife, Jill and I live, so I know it's true. They can't fool me. So in summary fashion, meat that's produced from grass-fed, pastured, 
grazing livestock systems is actually less sustainable than conventional grain-fed factory farm meat, which of course is less sustainable than plants for us to eat. And this is the summary. As we run out of land and water, this metric will become quite important. Uh, what, what is the feed conversion ratio? What does it take to produce a pound of anything? How, how does feed affect what's produced on the other end? Well, for industrial systems of beef, for instance, it takes eight pounds of feed to produce one pound of food. Notice it takes up to 70 pounds of feed, whether it's grass or otherwise, for grass-fed livestock to produce one pound of beef. And of course, it's one-to-one -one for picking plants out of your garden and eating it directly. Well, my statement that grass-fed livestock use more water than grain-fed has caused more arguments than almost any other, any other discussion I've had with prominent scientists, but it, it's a fact. And here's the data, which takes into account all sources of water, green, blue, gray. Take a look for yourself. There it is, circled on the right. And then, of course, both types of livestock operations, grain and grass-fed, use 50 to, to up to 100 times more water than growing plants for us to eat directly. Now, about the Go Meatless on Monday campaign. If, <laughs> if you do this, if you go meatless on Mondays, presuming you're eating meat on the other days of the week, well, you'll be contributing to climate change, pollution, global depletion of our planet's resources, and your own health on only six days of the week, then, <laughs> instead of seven. You'll be creating a, a false justification for your actions on those other six days of the week. In other words, please, let's not rest on the laurels of what you're doing right only one-seventh of the time. Now, quantitatively, what does eating less meat really mean? We talked about that yesterday as well. Just in, the, in a little over an hour I've been speaking here today, over eight million animals were slaughtered for us to eat in that one hour, eight million. 114,000 tons of grain were fed to livestock we're raising. But during that same one hour, 354 children in the world have died from starvation. 6,000 acres of tropical rainforest were destroyed and replaced by cattle. And over 4 million tons of greenhouse gases have been dumped into our atmosphere by livestock. Therefore, I'm advocating a much different approach than what the United Nations and others suggest when they state we should eat less meat. Well, because with that approach of eating less meat, only 7 million animals will be slaughtered in the next one hour. And only 113,000 tons of grain will be wasted, leaving only 353 children in the world that will starve to death in that next one hour. Isn't that what less means? So unlike Mark Bittman and Michael Pollan and all other eat less meat advocates and food gurus, I think these numbers should be zero. I sure do, and it's, it's easily attainable. There's no magic involved. Nothing has to be invented. No new technologies have to be employed. It's simply with what we choose to eat. And now we're going to take a quick look at the food service section of the policy of sustainability for the entire University of California system. Why? Well, because it's a perfect example of how the efforts of well-intentioned individuals and institutions can be so very far out of alignment with reality because of the definitions they're using. So you tell me, is this sustainable? What about the items I just highlighted in orange? Are those sustainable? <laughs> how about their primary objective of 20% by the year 2020? <laughs> is that sustainable? I mean, who, who thought of that, Professor 20? <laughs> and it's not much better with campuses on the east side of the United States, is it? Taken right off the, I took this right off the dining services website at Harvard's School of Public Health. Amazing. Last year, Cornell became the first Ivy League school to be MSC certified sustainable. It's quite a distinct honor, wouldn't you say? Yeah, that's right. Cornell has now joined other distinguished health conscious organizations such as McDonald's, <laughs> which is the first fa fast food chain to be MSC certified. Both examples of just how far away we are with steps toward true sustainability. So even at these prestigious universities, West Coast, East Coast, and those in between, they would certainly benefit from understanding and then adopting a more accurate view of sustainability and then translating it to their students, our future leaders, and to do it now. Otherwise, we'll continue floating around in a zone that I call pseudo-sustainability. That's exactly where we are today, never getting to where we need to be, but thinking that we're sustainable. Well, that's a, that's a very da dangerous predicament to be in, to think that you're something, but you're not. 
And one more important definition that needs refinement, ethics. The ethical consideration of what we choose to eat. The topic of conscious eating has always been about animal rights, animal welfare, hasn't it? The, the life and death of other living beings that we consume, how they're treated. Ethics has always been about this. But I think it's time to view conscious eating or ethics in a much different and certainly a much larger context. Is it ethical, for instance, for any of us to eat food that causes the extinction of other species if we don't need to? Is it ethical for the vast majority of humans on Earth to cause or contribute heavily to irreversible climate change, loss of ecosystems, and resource depletion, while 2% of us are living our lives by way of food choice to protect Earth? Is it ethical for any of us to use our planet in a way that exacerbates world hunger and extracts the potential for future generations to survive? It also then becomes a, a matter of social justice, doesn't it? The person sitting next to you who's eating steak, pork, chicken, cheese, fish, or eggs is taking away the resources that could be spread more evenly, more efficiently, and used to support the life of perhaps 20 or more people. Is it even ethical for 319 million Americans to impose their diet-related health care costs on the 7 million who choose to eat the right foods? So you see, it's time we rethink ethics. It, it needs to be framed much differently than just with animal rights. In fact, one of the chapters in my most recent book is titled, Why Should I Pay for What Everyone Else Decides to Eat? <laughs> it's a good question, isn't it? It makes a little sense to continue doing what our predecessors did in the late 1800s and early 1900s when we didn't know any better, and there were far less mouths to feed with more land and water to do so. Do, do any of you still use a, a typewriter or a feather quill pen? to write a message? Anybody using those? How about the Pony Express? Or, <laughs> or the stagecoach to send those messages? Or to travel, and you thought the internet was slow? <laughs> well, what about candles or kerosene lamps to read with at night? Anybody out there still using those to read my books with at night? <laughs> well, why not? Why aren't you using these things? I'll tell you why, because they're obsolete. That's why we've outgrown them. They're inefficient. They don't fit. And so it is with all meat, dairy, and fish. The world on a global basis can no longer support the production of these things. Just like the typewriter, just like the stagecoach. We need to evolve past them and we need to do it today because the clock is ticking. Almost everything we do, every decision we make every day is based on our culture, what we've learned, what someone else has told us to be acceptable or necessary after realizing that, that bloodletting here <laughs> wasn't so healthy for us after all, we miraculously stopped, even though we've been doing it for more than 3,000 years. There are culturally driven practices that we are accepting today, especially with food choices involving all animal products, that are much more unhealthy for our planet and for us than bloodletting. And by all counts, we don't have 3,000 years to get it right. Many organizations are quite concerned about how we're going to feed the growing human population expected to reach 9.6 billion by the year 2050 because demand for food, including meat and dairy, will nearly double what it is today. And looking at the future, we do have some troubling trends, there's no question. We'll likely see increased numbers in wealth of the middle class and an associated increase in demand for animal products, which will come at the expense of developing countries that have the most land. Meat consumption will rise astronomically in developing countries over the next 30 years, which will bring with it predictable increase in Western diseases such as heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Eventually, the wealth of any nation will be redefined in terms of the natural resources and strength of its sustainable systems. Our survival will depend on how quickly and accurately we begin to define this, this word sustainable. We'll see sustainability become a growth opportunity and a risk management strategy for businesses, essentially transforming economics. You know, futurists <laughs> sit around and ask, what one new idea will change the world drastically in the next century? Well, will it be new nanotechnology? Perhaps transhumanism and robotics? Traceability within businesses or even renewable energy, and re renewable energy systems? In terms of ensuring our existence, that one transforming idea that futurists are asking about 
is for all humans on Earth to eat only plant-based foods. This is where many of our problems begin, with statements such as this from organizations such as this. In fact, they are right. There's no question. The uh, livestock is important. The less we produce, the more secure food will be. No question about that. The demand to raise, slaughter, and eat animals is hardly believable. Last year, the one-year figures looked like this. With these figures expected to double by the year 2050, what exactly does the phrase eating less meat mean here? Perhaps uh, 73 million tons of beef will be produced. Sadly, this is an example of how global depletion by way of animal agriculture is being addressed, which is that it's not being addressed. This is the action statement from one of the most widely recognized environmental organizations in the world. And as you can see, their idea of attacking climate change is by reducing our use of fossil fuels, stopping Keystone and TPP, keeping coal in the ground. Wow, those are pretty novel ideas. I'm glad they thought of that themselves. Haven't heard those before. Nothing at all about the, the, the effects of animal agriculture. So when you join a movement like this, understand that you will only be moving part of the way. At this stage, one would have to ask, what are all the conservation groups doing about this problem? You know, the ones we give our money to. All these groups are concerned about climate change, no problem there, but none of them have made a statement about the profound effect eating animals has on our environment, despite the fact that it does, and despite the fact that we've entrusted these groups to preserve and protect our planet. Where's all of our donated money going? Aside from those conservation groups who are still in the dark, there are a few researchers and organizations that are quite aware of the dire predicament that we're in and the very short timelines that we're faced with. Any of these folks will bluntly tell you that our species is in a state of unsustainability and that we can't remain on this course for very much longer. They'll all tell you that. But not one of them is connecting that final dot. They continue telling us that our survival is in peril and that we need to change. But change what? And they make it very clear that we need to stop overconsuming and overproducing. But, but again, overconsuming and overproducing, what exactly? Again, fossil fuels and waste are very easy targets for them to point their fingers at. Without genuine concern for the urgency of the problem, we tend to point our fingers at other targets related to sustainability that have less emotional ties. Those in influential positions, our leaders, are currently addressing the animal agriculture sustainability connection by adopting any one of these methods. Usually the first one, denial general misuse of the word sustainable, over-focus on climate change, and suppression of, of information. Well, why aren't we getting the truth from those with platforms? That's a good question. Those who are guiding us. Well, it's because of three reasons. First, they're comfortably unaware. <laughs> or second, they're partially aware, but they simply can't get themselves, bring themselves around to making the right statement because they themselves consume animals. After all, how can we expect one of our leaders to guide us toward health and restoration of our planet if they can't even do it for themselves? And lastly, many of our leaders are afraid. They're afraid they're going to lose their audience. In the year 2000, the United Nations established eight Millennium Development Goals, or MDGs. These are quantifiable goals to be achieved by the year 2015 that addressed important issues like world poverty, disease, gender equality, hunger, and even environmental sustainability. Well, obviously, these goals failed because all of these issues still exist and, and are even greater problems today than they were 15 years ago. One reason for their failure is because these MDGs did not properly address the core problem of human rights, never accurately defined what environmental sustainability is supposed to mean or how to achieve it, because they never properly positioned food choice, and they never properly positioned animal agriculture in any of their efforts. Human rights and environmental sustainability and food choice are deeply interconnected. Knowing the MDGs ran out of time and they failed, the United Nations held a sustainability summit just last year in New York City, where 193 nations formally adopted an agenda for sustainability, and they adopted a brand new set of global goals to be achieved by the year 2030. In some ways, it was impressive. But of the 17 goals, 10 are directly, directly related to food choice, as they should be. Therefore, it's highly unlikely that these goals will ever be met if leaders fail to understand this concept of optimal relative sustainability. And why are they waiting until the year 2030? 
I mean, look at their number two goal here about promoting sustainable agriculture in order to end world hunger. How's that going to happen if there's not universal definition of the word sustainable and if that definition's not accurate? And here's some of their other goals, such as ensuring sustainable management of water, sustainable consumption and production patterns, conserving our oceans. They even plan to halt biodiversity loss, which we saw yesterday is accelerating. That's because they've never factored in properly food choice. This is important because this is what will be driving global policy making and funding over the next 14 years. Regarding sustainability, picture two points in time, and this is important to understand. Picture two points in time and space. Point A is where we currently are as a global community. Point B is where we need to go, the point of true sustainability. Now, we're very far away from point B, and there's a vast sea of challenges between the two. Most businesses and individuals and organizations in the world are getting on board a large, powerful ship at point A, trying to get to sustainability. But their navigators don't know how to get to point B. Their compasses and GPS systems, and Siri, I guess, are broken, <laughs> which is very dangerous because all those on board this large ship think they're going to make it to point B, but they won't. They're floating around further and further away from it in a zone that I call, again, pseudo-sustainability. Worse, there's a narrowing timeline before point B will be too far out of range and we'll never make it. Well, a few of us sitting on the dock at point A, led by Stephen Shore, can clearly see point B. And we know how to get there rather easily. We could probably just hop in and swim over to point B. <laughs> but here's the kicker. We can't get there by ourselves. No, getting to point, the point of true sustainability or point B is a collective effort. We have to move the critical mass, taking all those on that other large ship with us. We need to travel together and quickly enough or none of us will make it. That's the way sustainability is, especially for humanity. Therefore, our leaders, those steering that large, powerful ship with most of the world on it, our leaders need a new navigation system. Every five years, the U.S. dietary guidelines are updated. These guidelines influence many programs in the United States and in Canada and certain other areas of the world. For the first time earlier this year, it was recommended by their, actually last year was recommended by their prestigious advisory committee that these new dietary guidelines take into strong consideration the environment. That's for the first time ever. So that set off campaigns like this one in the positive direction with over 100 major health and environmental groups in support of these recommendations. But it also set off a massive backlash, as expected, from the meat and dairy industries. Because they believe that scientific evidence regarding the environment and food has no place in the dietary guidelines. Just a few months ago, these guidelines were released officially. And there was no mention of any of the advisory committee's recommendations about our environment. No mention whatsoever. It was very disappointing for me to see this, but um, I am encouraged to see grassroots efforts like these. Wonderful new documentary films like this one to help matters. Food Choices was just released globally on September 2nd, much like Cowspiracy. I was very fortunate. I was very fortunate to be one of the lead consultants for this film, and I'm very excited for all of you to see it. I hope you'll be able to, to join me next Friday when it'll be launched here at this event. And talk about disconnects. <laughs> I thought it was bizarre. In 1991, when only 78 percent of Americans identified themselves as an environmentalist, meaning we could find more than 20 percent of us who felt that the air we breathe, water we drink, our land, forests, oceans, biodiversity, and all life around us aren't necessary. <laughs> that, <laughs> that's the single largest disconnect that we could possibly have today, I believe. Well, Unbelievable as it may seem, that 78%, according to this last poll this year, has dropped to 42%. So today in 2016, less than one half of all Americans believe that the environment is of any value to them. So let's put that into context. We need to bring everyone up to speed regarding the importance of preserving what keeps them alive <laughs> before we then educate them as to how we're destroying it. The decline in environmentalism is being blamed on the fact that this issue has become politicized 
and that Americans don't want to be associated with a politically charged issue. Well, it should be politicized. <laughs> the health of our environment and therefore the need to eliminate animal agriculture should be on the number one priority item or at the top of the priority list on every policymaker's desk today. Every governor, every mayor, every senator, every House of Representatives, every advisor. It should be the number one priority item for every leader of every country in the world, beginning with our own President of the United States. Many have asked me what they can do to help create positive change in the world regarding this environment issue. Uh, and that's a great question. A good starting point is to follow us on Facebook, on Twitter, on our website, and getting involved on our online ambassador program, which is starting in the next few weeks. And, and you know, you've already started this process of what you can do by being here. Remarkably, this statement was made almost a thousand years ago by someone who understood the environment and the animals around him. Well, I have my own set of predictions. Not that anybody wants to hear these, but I'm going to tell you anyway. <laughs> of what might happen in the future over the next 10, 20, 30 years. And it goes something like this. In the year 2020, the next set of new dietary guidelines will be released, and our environment will be emphasized. And therefore, policies will be already underway in, that incentivize, or maybe create those taxes we talked about. It's going to incentivize the growing and eating of whole plant-based foods. By the year 2025, it will be standard public perception that eating animals is not healthy for our environment or for our own human health. It will be frowned upon in public settings, much like cigarette smoking is today, where you see signs that they don't allow cigarette smoking. We don't allow eating meat in this establishment. They will be talking about this transformation on Good Morning America and The View and 60 Minutes, if they're still around. By the year 2030, Fossil fuels are no longer used by 193 nations, but they all sign a document that impose a tax on any country that produces meat or dairy, now realizing that global warming and climate change are still advancing, and that they should have addressed this animal agriculture connection to climate change 20 years earlier. By the year 2052, I'll be over 100 years old. <laughs> uh, and for my birthday <laughs> in 2052, uh, in an, I'll see this. In an attempt to preserve Earth's very few remaining resources, we're going to see that producing and eating animals becomes illegal. Of course, given the tipping points in front of us, I'd like to see all this happening today, uh, before noon. <laughs> Some argue that it's unrealistic to ask the global population to eliminate meat, dairy, and fish, uh, not only as a functional change, but behavior psychologists would suggest that we don't use words like eliminate, stop, or don't when advocating change in food choice or any type of change because that's too negative. It creates barriers such as feeling of infringement of individual rights. So instead, many suggest to use the approach of kindly asking everyone to, uh, could you please begin replacing or uh, could you kindly substitute animal products with plant-based alternatives because you shouldn't tell anyone that they might have to have something taken away or to stop an unhealthy habit even though it's adversely affecting them and everything and everyone around them but don't infringe on their individual rights well is that so just just where would you use the words could you please replace or kindly substitute here in any of these now i understand the importance of empowerment through the spoken word but at some point in time, the seriousness of a situation must, must dictate an action to be taken, regardless of what words are chosen. It's time to switch out whose rights we're worried about. Knowing everything I talked about yesterday and today, there's certainly ample reason for feeling quite discouraged, isn't there? Yeah, anyone feeling discouraged out there? Yeah, I, I understand. Regarding loss of our planet's life systems, what we've done to our planet, there's so much bad news and the truth around us. And even with increased awareness, it seems we'll be constantly fighting an uphill battle. But in the midst of potential despair, there can be found great news. There's an easy solution to global depletion and those planetary boundaries that we talked about yesterday. We don't have to destroy our planet or ourselves to eat. In fact, it's the other way around. 
But we must change, and it is a choice. We need to substitute, replace, eliminate the practice of raising, slaughtering, and consuming animals, and we must do it now. Now, there's great news in all this because the food choices that are optimal for our planet's health happen to be the very same food choices that optimize our own health. How easy is that? You know what? We, we could all be heroes. That's right. All of us. We could even be superheroes swooping down and <laughs> saving lives and, sa and saving our planet with every single thing we eat every single day. Yeah, a superhero. I, mean, I don't know about you, but I'm, I'm feeling better already. <laughs> well, something quite telling happened at the end of the annual Global Climate Change Conference that we talked about earlier yesterday. In her closing remarks, the executive secretary of the conference, Christiana Figueres, provided a summary of the conclusions of 200 nations, NGOs, and researchers by stating this about our future, about greenhouse gas emissions, about climate change. She said this, the science is unquestionable. Therefore, despite the obvious effects on the industry itself, we must call for the elimination of the use of coal as an energy source. And she said we must do this immediately. Notice that she didn't say that we should use less coal <laughs> or better coal <laughs> or, or for us to use only local or humane coal. I'm pretty sure I didn't hear her say that. I also didn't hear her say that we should all go coal less on Mondays. In fact, she said we should eliminate coal, even though coal carries with it roughly the same amount of greenhouse gas emissions that raising livestock does. And coal has no real direct effect on water scarcity, world hunger, loss of biodiversity, rapid rate of extinctions, and all other areas of global depletion, but raising and eating animals does. So the door has been opened, hasn't it? perhaps inadvertently by Ms. Figueres and 200 nations, but as far as I'm concerned, the global stage for massive food choice change has been set. If there is an imminent threat to our planet and to us, which there is, well, we should certainly be able to call for its elimination and for it to be done immediately. As a global community, we'd have no difficulty, I think, joining arms to avert a looming nuclear war. It'd become our number one priority without question. But the cause of our demise may never be a nuclear disaster. It may be very well something as simple as food choice and the fact that it was never placed as our number one priority. So when we talk about definitions, it's time to, f to finish reshaping the word sustainable. This, this is my definition. And if you think about it, we really don't want to create a world uh, that is simply allows for our existence, that uh, uh, we simply are surviving uh, or to be merely sustained. No, that's not good enough. At this stage, we need to create a world where there's quick regeneration, rapid rejuvenation, a world where we and other species together can flourish. That's my vision. And we're the unique group of generations living right now that can make or break this opportunity. It'll be our defining ethos. It'll be our legacy by which future generations will remember us. So I encourage and challenge everyone to become more aware about your food choices. Seek more accurate definitions. Understand and appreciate the timelines and the tipping points that we're faced with. And then let's all commit to making a difference. But not just with our own health, or our own life. No, that's not good enough. Let's all commit to making a difference in someone else's life and a difference in the long-term health of our planet. But let's do it now, not later. We might not have a later. And let's think about making a difference every day of the week, not just on Mondays. Be a, be a superhero for those around you, guiding them and saving lives every single day. That, my friends, is what sustainability and positive change to achieve it is really all about. With that in mind, let's all of us here today, in this room, watching the streaming or on future replays, let's all of us go out and inspire others to become aware. Thank you so very much. A tremendous audience. And it's an honor for me to be here. Thank you. Thank all of you. Thank you so much. Thank you very, very much.
Thank you. Terrific audience. Thank you. Thank you.